Hi, uh, we're live today with uh, Dr. John Grabowski, who is the Director of Research at the Western Reserve Historical Society and the Associate Professor at Case Western Reserve University. Hello, John. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Foundry. Uh, we are here at the Foundry. We're the Community Rowing and Sailing Center in Cleveland, and we're located on Columbus Road uh, in the Flats, so we're right along the river. And um, uh, John was here today, Professor Grabowski, to talk to the Clinton Leadership uh, Institute class. Very engaging uh, discussion this morning here at the Foundry. So, uh, thanks for being with us, and we'll get started today. Uh, certainly, uh, you're a noted historian in the Cleveland area, John, and I uh, want to know, how did you first become interested in history? I know you mentioned you were a chemist or were interested in being a chemist early on. You know, I, well, and before I thought of being a chemist, I, my father was uh, was my first historian. Uh, it was neighborhood history. He grew up in the neighborhood, so I spent hours walking around the neighborhood and sort of getting acclimated to his view of the neighborhood. So it started as local, and um, then I went off to Case Western Reserve University, still living at home. My father died at that point, but I was living with my mother. And I was going to be a chemist uh, because that was, uh, there was a job there, but I still loved history and uh, changed my, my major to history. And uh, two things happened. I had a very good professor, David Van Tassel, but uh, about the same time I walked into the Western Reserve Historical Society because it was a history place mm -hmm. and uh, asked them if they had a job. Yeah. And uh, they, they hired me, I won't say when. And I eventually built a career in their archives and library. And if you're looking for a place where Cleveland's history really lives, it's in the collections of the Western Reserve Historical Society, and particularly at the Cleveland History Center. So it became very familiar. I helped develop collections related to ethnic history in Cleveland. And uh, a bit later after that, my professor, David Van Tassel, created a project called the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History. And in 1981, he asked me to serve as managing editor. And that really was, I was in the deep end of the pool <laughs> at that point. So it was those three things that they really built as. Uh, today at the Foundry, uh, John, you had mentioned, or your talk was all about immigration and the early stages of immigration in Cleveland. So how, how do you see current immigration patterns uh, affecting our city today? What's your take on that? Well, I think the, the effect on the city is, is going to be twofold. It's, it's going to be demographic change because the immigration streams will change or the push factors around the world will help. Uh, of course, a lot depends on what the legalities and laws are and who can come over. Uh, but the other thing that's going to change, I think it's, it's going to change the city's growth in terms of its technology, its medicine, and its education. In, in two ways, people who have the skill sets that are needed uh, may come as immigrants. That's one of the ways you, you get a green card. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way we're seeing it, of course, is the uh, university case, Western Reserve, Cleveland State, a large international student population. So it's technically not immigration because these students will leave, yet there's a diversity that you're seeing here, and there's these students are becoming acquainted with the city of Cleveland. And, and, the result might be maybe mm -hmm. an ultimate move or familiarity mm -hmm. and, and maybe promotion, promoting the city of Cleveland. So, mm -hmm. uh, Cleveland will change the way the world is changing in terms of demographics. Mm -hmm. But again, that depends on how the laws are enforced or created mm -hmm. the policy. Interesting. Uh, you certainly, your book's right here, your uh, Cleveland book, uh, Cleveland A to Z, and you talk about Cleveland's history through some stories. Are you still finding new stories that you want to write the second uh, version of the book? Or? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're finally going to reprint it. Uh, Kent State University is going to do the second edition, but it'll be pretty much the first edition. But there's stories all the time. I, I've become, you've probably heard me in the talk, become a fan of Duck Island. Yes. And, and the story of what's happening in Duck Island. So I think that's there. I'd like to do more stories on specific neighborhoods in Cleveland. And there are a whole raft of individuals, historical individuals, that, that we need to touch upon in the city's history. Uh, I, I think mayors like you know, Tom L. Johnson is in there. I want to do something on Newton D. Baker. Baker is mm -hmm. a very important person. He doesn't have a sketch. So, you know, it's endless. I may be writing a book for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. You had mentioned Duck Island. I think that's an interesting topic. And the story of Duck Island, I think, is that it was named such because they would duck in trying to um, 
hide from people chasing them with liquor and booze back in Prohibition. Yeah, so I, I've heard that one, so I, I, I don't know really what okay. that is. That's yeah. one of those, but you know, give, give the fact that the founder holds, has no speaking. Yes, yeah, we do. You know, maybe that's apparently where it comes from. Yes, we do. Uh, it's just, you know, neighborhood legend and lore is just, uh, it's, it's fascinating. And the real trick is to trace it down. But uh, Duck Island is a special place. The best part of Duck Island is when you're going down the one street, I think it's West 19th, you look up and see the gardens of transportation. Mm -hmm. There's no other view like that in the city. Right, right. right. what a beautiful uh, structure. Uh, you had talked, um, briefly mentioned in your talk today about the challenge though with Duck Island as you bring in this new development, you're kind of pushing out the residents that are of modest means. So how do you address that? Or what's, is there a good solution in place to address all that development? I, I, you know, I don't know if there's a good solution. I, I don't know the legalities of zoning. I, I don't know the legalities of permission to build and so forth. Uh, but I think ultimately, and this is my opinion, the, the best neighborhood is a neighborhood that retains not only its, its built structure, or as much of its built structure as it can, but the memory of that neighborhood by the people who have lived there for a long time. I think, mm -hmm. I think if you go into a bar in Duck Island or you're a newcomer to Duck Island, maybe the best thing is to sit next to somebody who's lived in Duck Island mm -hmm. for 50 years. Good point. You know, yeah. and, and hear about you know, what the issues are and what his memories are and what they did on the island when they were kids. And Good point. Here, you know, yeah. so, you know. And just the stories you learn. You had mentioned about John Rockefeller um, started out as a bookkeeper right on this peninsula, the Columbus Road Peninsula. I didn't know that. Right across the street, practically, uh, that's where he got his start. Um, you know so much about Cleveland history. You have it all documented in books. It's in your head rummaging around. Uh, what's your favorite you know, little-known fact about Cleveland history? Do you have one little favorite or a couple tidbits that you'd really love to talk yeah, about? The one is, is the east side, west side, which is, you know, we joke and kid each other about east side, west side, but I think very few people understand that the west side literally was open for settlement later than the east side. And that, if you know that, then that leads you into a deeper, I think very meaningful story. Who lived there before? Native Americans. I mean, there was a large Native American population at the end of the 1700s, but there were mounds and fortresses around. So, you know, finding out that the West Side is, you know, 1805 and not 1796 mm -hmm. opens that up. And, and the other thing about East West, I think people, there, there are two other things. One is until they get in the flats, literally, and look both ways, East and West, they do not understand the enormous divide. Mm -hmm. now, because most of us drive over the flats or ride the RTA over the flats, and we just don't sense that divide. But the other one, and this is really cheap, is that you know, you know, you can go to the east side from what from the east side to the west side without crossing the river. Have you heard that mm -hmm. one? Mm -hmm. No. You simply go across the public square because our streets are numbered east and west oh. on, on opposite sides of the square. Bingo. 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 <laughs> good, good one to know. Uh, you talk about as groups migrate into Cleveland and they leave Cleveland. There's always this rub about how do groups fit together, what's the puzzle piece, how do they fit into communities. Can you give examples where collaboration is so important on either development or projects where you need to collaborate and get people to think together? You know, I, I think what here is it's not so much groups defined by ethnicity, but groups defined by political uh, inclinations and, and also by their will. And that, that project was the creation of the mall. Mm -hmm. in the early 1900s, and the mall really put Cleveland on the national map as a very, very progressive city. And you had people like Tom L. Johnson, who was the mayor, working with people who were politically opposed to him on the mall. So when you look at the mall project, it brings together people of different political ideologies, but they all felt that the mall was something the city needed. So, mm -hmm. so a great exhibit years ago at the Art Museum called Progressive Vision that explores that. So that's a defining point for the city of mm -hmm. uh, And so, you know, Tom Johnson is, is, is agreeing with people who he's going to disagree with in terms of municipal ownership of utilities mm -hmm. in the city mm -hmm. uh, to get them all. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You, uh, you wear many hats. You're at Case Western Reserve. You're at the Western Reserve Historical Society. How do you do all this? How do you get it all done? It's, 
is a synergy. Uh, it, it's been natural for me to move between the, the, the two institutions. Uh, the position I hold was, was created uh, for an important purpose. It guarantees that the historical society will always have a credential academic historian on the staff, and the university will always have somebody who does public or applied history on the staff. Mm -hmm. It's an endowed position, so mm -hmm. when I retire and leave the position, it will go on. Uh, but it's, it's wonderful for me. I'm teaching a course on the American Civil War now, it's every year. And mm -hmm. for the last three weeks, my students have spent one day a week in the research library of West Museum Historical Society reading original Civil War documents and papers. Mm -hmm. It's a final assignment for the class. Nice. So there's, there's, there's a connection between the two. Um, and I've man managed to do it fairly well. You, uh, you're certainly good at what you do, and you, during your talks, you bring to life a lot of the history that's around us. How important is it to do what you did today? You, you, you have a presentation where you talk about history in front of a, a group of largely younger professionals. So passing that history on, you know, orally is so so important. But people either read about history or someone tells them about history. But how important is that for you and your mission to? pass along your knowledge. It's, it's extremely important. Uh, I think history is, is a critical factor in our everyday lives. It's not something that's over. History is still here today. And in speaking to a group, uh, as I did today, younger people, uh, uh, understanding that they don't know the depth that I have. The, the approach is to, to look at topics, try to look at those topics through their eyes, through mm -hmm. the neighborhoods and the changes and the issues they're confronting, then to back from a contemporary issue into a historical. Mm -hmm. or to choose historical issues that I know are going to resonate with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that's what a public historian tries to do, and that's what a good academic historian tries to do, is to, to write or speak in a way that has an attraction for people who generally would pick up a history book if they have to. Right. What, uh, in, in your career, um, you know, you talk about... Uh, people we see every day, they're, they're right in front of you, like you don't even realize that, oh, like you mentioned the Carnegie Bridge, the, the sculpture on there. That whole sculpture, that whole bridge is a story in and of itself, but what, what is it that we can do today in the modern era to attract younger students, and I'm talking about middle school, maybe elementary school, into a love of history? Is it, do we expose them through reading, through books, through visuals? like PowerPoints, what, what would be the key to get kids motivated? I, I, th I think uh, PowerPoints are probably passe with a lot of younger kids. I, I, th I think tours and actual experiences, that's one of the things the Historical Society does at Hale Farm and Village. Mm -hmm. you know, we have two incredible programs at the Historical Society, one's at Hale Farm and Village, you're literally, literally brought into the past, but we have a major youth entrepreneurship program. Mm -hmm. And so we're teaching young people entrepreneurial skills, but we're basing them on historical stories. And, and people like Garrett Morgan, the African-American inventor, mm -hmm. or John D. Rockefeller, famous people. So they, they get history, but they get an education that, that teaches them what entrepreneurship is all about. Mm -hmm. So that, and it's hands on as well. And, mm -hmm. and that program has just really, really grown. Mm -hmm. So you take a contemporary need, and all contemporary needs have historical mm -hmm. antecedents, mm -hmm. and you find a way to marry them. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand uh, how young people learn. Uh, long documentaries no longer seduce my students in sure. CRR. They need something that moves fast sure. and whatever else. So sure. uh, you, you change the product, but what you can do is you can never change the authenticity of the product, nor can you avoid the edges of history. Right. Right. And once you, you, you just can't skirt the ugly parts. Mm -hmm. It's all part of the whole, it's baked yeah. into the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, the past is a foreign place for many people. And for many people, the past was a good place, but for many people, it's not a good place. Mm -hmm. you, know, that's, you, you need to, to bring that into the narrative. We're getting close to the end, but if you have to uh, look ahead, uh, what do you see as the direction that history as an academic subject is going. I mean, do you see that being uh, more multimedia as we move ahead into collegiate and, and you know, high school ranks? Is it more of a multimedia approach or how do you see that in the future? 
I see it in, in two ways, and some of my colleagues at CWRU are really good at this, and that is, you know, books are always going to be with us, but they are engaging and writing very meaningful articles for Slate, mm -hmm. Conversation, and other online sources. One of my colleagues, uh, uh, Peter Schulman, uh, is, is tweets, mm -hmm. and, and his tweets have been picked up by the New York Times and the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. So we as historians have to embrace the new technologies of communication mm -hmm. to get a product out uh, to be heard. And that, that's what I'm seeing there. Uh, and the same thing the same thing's happening with the historical society. You mm -hmm. know, our collections, you know, the, the best thing about museums like the Western Reserve Historical Society is the authenticity of the materials that reside there. Mm -hmm. and, and in a time where truth and fact are constantly Question. Mm -hmm. Museums play an increasingly important role. The point is, how do you get them in the door? And you do that in a virtual way through your website. You do that mm -hmm. by having a robust social media program. The Encyclopedia of Cleveland History now has an incredible social media program. Yes, one, of my students, yeah, one of my grad assistants runs that. And, and, and that's how we drive readership to mm -hmm. our articles. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, even like the, the museum, like the Rock Hall, they have a whole uh, library system at the Cuyahoga, you know, community college. It's all, it's a whole library setup where they, you can go and research and do, yeah. so it's so important to have that in place. Yeah, you know, you, yeah, you can do the virtual, but my, my feeling, and I've, I've been working, I won't tell you how long with actual archival materials, but when you have the actual letter in your hand that was signed by somebody, it's far different than reading it on a screen. Mm -hmm. And as I watch my Civil War students holding a diary that somebody had in their knapsack, mm -hmm. they realize that there's a reality there, there's a tangibility to that type of past. And uh, you know, it's our duty as a community and as a society to make sure that the original is preserved and the original is kept inviolable. Well, so we're so lucky in the Cleveland area to have such great museums. Western Reserve Historical Society, uh, Natural History Museum, Cliff Museum of Art, that shows us exactly that. You can see the real artifacts. You can, in a lot of cases, not touch them, but see them up, up close and personal. That's so important for Cleveland. Yeah, yeah it, it is. And you know, that, that you know, the museums in this city, you know, we were discussing this at the meeting, for a city that is now our size, this is just unbelievable mm -hmm. in terms, you know, and, and it is the legacy that the future donors and future citizens are going to need to, to pay attention to to keep that up. Um, that's what makes us a very special city. Well, you're a very special person in a special city, so thank, thank you, so you very much for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you.